Bonjour, famille, and welcome back to the OCD Family Podcast. Today is pretty special, y'all, because we are welcoming Dr. Frederick Ardema, one of the co-founders of inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy, to our family table. So come on in, s'il vous plaît, asseyez-vous, or uh, grab a chair, because it's family time. I'm Nicole Morris, licensed marriage and family therapist and mental health correspondent. And let me be the first to say, welcome to the family. The OCD family, that is. I am here to create a community of support for family members, spouses, partners, parents, adult children, as there may be adult words, and chosen family of OCD sufferers and their community. I've had over 22 years of experience in the mental health field, but please note that this information does not qualify or substitute as a diagnostic evaluation, therapy, or treatment, and it is presented on an as-is basis. Please follow up with a qualified mental health provider in your area regarding concerns for yourself or loved ones. Thank you for joining us today. Now, let's get started. Okay, y'all, so welcome, good day, and Thank you for dropping by, fam. I cannot believe it's September already, but whether I can believe it or not, it's September! And it's a holiday weekend here in the States. We call it Labor Day, and we celebrate laboring, working. (laughs) But I'm going to go out on a limb here, fam, and say that folks aren't tuning in to learn more about Labor Day here in America, because today I have the pleasure and unique opportunity to sit down with one of the co-founders, one of the architects of ICBT. Now, if you're newer to our family gatherings, let me give you some context. ICBT, also known as inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy, is one of our evidence-based treatments that is used to help treat OCD. So we have ICBT, we also have ERP, which is exposure and response prevention therapy, and we have medication support that all have research backing how they can help treat OCD. It's also my belief that ACT, that's acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness, and or metacognitive approaches can also augment treatment in any of these areas. But these are my top three, my bee's knees for the treatment of OCD. So what a privilege it is to sit down with Fred, one of the men himself that co-founded ICBT. Fred is currently a full professor at the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Montreal with some pretty exciting work in the queue. But I was able to snag some time, and we're going to talk more about his breadth of work, which includes over 100 peer-reviewed publications, chapters, abstracts. We're going to talk about the evolution of ICBT research and what we can look forward to in the future with Fred. But first, I just want to know, if you've been around our family gatherings for a bit, you've heard me talk about ICBT before. But some of y'all, you're new to it. You're like, ICB what? (laughs) Or some of y'all have heard whisperings about it, maybe observed dialogue around it. Or you're here and you're like, I don't know what it meant. I thought it stood for internet-based CBT, which it doesn't. But internet-based fans don't come at me. I get it. I get how acronyms work. But we're going to be talking a bit more about ICBT today. That's inference-based CBT. And our guest, Fred. And how he, along with the late Kiernan O'Connor, really constructed this idea, this inference-based approach, into a whole treatment model, which is now being tested with randomized control trials in different labs, and really has roughly 30 years of research backing it at this point. So today I wanted to get to know more about the story, no pun intended, (laughs) wink wink, behind ICBT and how this model came to fruition. We're also going to be talking about what ICBT is, but spoiler alert, it is complex. We're going to do our best here, but there's a lot more to take in. So if you've tried to wrap your mind around it before and gotten lost, it's okay. There's a lot to digest. But that being said, for as many of a model as this is, I really feel like Fred helps us simplify it down. So I'd love to hear your feedback as well. But I know I was impressed with how much easier and easier it gets to not only understand, but also just apply ICBT, both as a practitioner and as a person with lived experience of OCD. So I'm really thankful to Fred for taking the time to chat with us today. Also, I mean, would it really even be family time 
if we weren't getting to know each other a bit better. Have you ever gone to a family potluck with a new face and not spilled the tea a bit, learned a little more, shared a story, poked a little bit at yourself? I know I do it. So when Brad said he was game to uh, have a little broader chitty chat, I jumped at the opportunity. So yes, we're going to talk about ICBT, but you know what? We're also going to talk about things we've done, what we haven't done, or what we would do if we could do without (laughs) regret. I mean, it's going to be fun times. So without further ado, let's get to it. Welcome back to the OCD Family Podcast. So we are getting started on the lighter side. Just getting to know you. Okay. We still have some fun collection. I always find this to be an interesting question. But Fred, how do you, if you do, take your coffee? Black. Nothing in it. Same, Fred. Oh my goodness. People are like, don't you want? And I'm like, no, I want nothing but the coffee. (laughs) No cream in the morning, no sugar. Just... I honestly, I can't stand sweetened coffee. Judge me, family. I can't. I can't. It just. Yeah. No, same thing here. Unless you're going to do a cappuccino, then I like. But that's that's a whole different evening type of coffee. You know? Yeah, you're yeah. you're buying into the milk, the froth, all of that. If you're <laughs> you're specifically going for that, you're like, I've had dinner. I'm gonna relax with a cappuccino. Maybe you could do cappuccino in the morning too, folks. I know. But yeah, I agree. That's like a specialty drink, though. It's kind of like not all martinis are the same. You wouldn't be like a a straight up martini is similar to like a lemon drop. You you have to go in saying I want a lemon drop. So coffee and martinis, we've started off strong. You see where my priorities lie. Okay, you've had the preview to this one because we chatted a little bit before about it. If you were a burger topping, like a hamburger or cheeseburger impossible burger what would you be oh so it has to be a topping yeah well you can operationalize topping however you want i would say i i would rather be the burger itself or the beyond burger way you eat them yes but as far as toppings go uh i would have to go with the onion for sure onion okay i'm getting a feel fred you like the straight black coffee you like your burger just beyond burger I love it. Okay, this is an interesting one because I think we can tie this in later to our ICBT question. And I was real proud of myself for this one. What is the strangest thing you used to believe as a child? Oh, God. That's a good question. Right? Bring Bring it in the big guns here. It has to be bizarre. I mean, uh, if you define strange as bizarre, you can, right? If you were inferring meaning there. Right. I guess the strangest thing I believed as a child was that not worrying was natural. And for a child, that is natural. But Yes. So strange, it should be natural for a child. But from an adult perspective, you know, well, it's hard to get back into it, right? For a human being, it's normal to worry. And yes, as a child. So that's so interesting because you co-found ICBT. And as a child, it sounds like, if I'm understanding you correctly, you didn't really worry about many things. No, it's still amazing to me when I look back on it. And I hope that it's the case for most children. Although I know it's not always the case, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, I remember up until seven years old, I did not worry. Well, and then it starts to come in slowly. You got a sense of piety, you got a sense of rules, you got a sense of, of all these things, and then it comes. And it's natural. It's part of growing up. Yeah. But I can still think of the remember of not ever worrying. Yeah. Oh, my word. That's so fascinating, considering that you treat OCD, you've been a researcher for OCD. That, that's fascinating. I'm going to have to revisit that one later because I'm going to have to, like, digest that one a little bit. You know what mine is? This is not even close to what yours is. But my mom used to sing a song to us when we were sick or feeling really crappy or whatever. She would sing a little song. I love you, a bushel and a peck. I don't even know if that's the technical name of the song. But I was under the belief. (laughs) I was reasoning, if you will. I'm going to put in all the therapist jokes. But I was reasoning that she created this song as a special little lovely lullaby to comfort us when we were little. So when I was in high school, I don't know if you've ever seen the musical Guys and Dolls. 
but I was watching the musical with my class, like in a speech class or something. And the song came on and I was floored because I was like, that's my mom's song. And they're like, your mom didn't make that song. That, that's like a popular song. So that is probably, like, I feel like I'm a fairly aware person, but I thought my mom was writing Broadway-level lullabies just for us. And I was like, oh, my gosh, how have I never seen this movie or heard her reference it? She did not cite her source. I thought she was the creator. So it, it was interesting. What would you say, outside of work, which takes a lot of our mind and our focus, I know, what is one of your favorite topics of conversation to talk about if you're not talking about work? Oh, wow, that's hard because my work is very much aligned with my personal interest at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what do I like to talk about as title work? I have an interest in politics to a degree. You know? mm -hmm. I like talking about gardening. I like talking about animals. Yeah. Um, do you well, have any animals? I mean, you still. We always had used to have dogs, you know. Yeah. Uh, but they pass away. Yeah. And uh, you need a little break in between, right, before you come in again. Yes, yeah, so you gotta let your heart heal. They are fur family, and they're unconditionally loving. So fur family is hard to lose. So it's fair. Yeah, I'm a dog person myself. So uh, I think you answered that question perfectly. <laughs> no bias at all. See. Okay. How about this? How many languages? I hear your accent. I know you're up in Canada. How many languages do you speak? Several, not all of them very well, I have to say. There's a dialect that's spoken where I'm from in the northern part of the Netherlands, which is not the same as that. So if you would count that as a language, that's one. Count that, it as a language, sure. <laughs> I will count that one. Then there's, because that dialect is very close to German and Germany, where right. I used to live, so I know German as well. And I actually had it in high school as part of the coursework, Dutch itself, obviously. English very early on, and then French. Uh, although my French, spoken French is not that good, but I can read it, uh, etc. I can read it fine. So how many are we at now? One, two, three, <laughs> at least four. Four. I'm at five. I'm impressed. I know how to say like three phrases in a bunch of languages, but I only fluently <laughs> speak okay. English. I took French in high school. Parlez-vous français? Oui. Um, but I'm not good at it. So anybody that listens, that is tuning in. Uh, that's, that's pretty good anyways, because I, I can't say I'm really fluent in any of them either, apart from Dutch and English. Although I would say my English is probably better than my Dutch at this point. When I talk to my parents, then sometimes I, I stumble quite a bit more than I used to, because I already lived for more than 10 years in Canada. Well, so yeah. I, I practice it a lot. You lose the fluency of it. Yeah. Did you move to Canada for a professorship and doing research or what brought you from the Netherlands over to Canada? I moved to Canada because of my work, my present work. Yeah. So I moved to Canada out of love. No, not because of my career. For love. Nothing wrong with that. There's no, nothing wrong. It's a wonderful thing. So I love that. Okay. So I speak one, you speak five, but you, you, as you said, not fluently, but you can read it. I think that counts because I can read Banyo, I can read Azul. This does not get me through life, but you can actually read, read, and I, 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 I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Okay. So one more, because these are fun. Growing up in the Netherlands or up in Canada, do you guys play the game Monopoly? I was thinking about this because I don't know if this is a game that is played in every culture. Yeah, yeah, we lived in Western Europe, right? So we had the uh, Monopoly uh, for sure. Yeah, 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 we played it often. But you yeah. played it often. Okay, so here's the question. Have you ever fully finished a game of Monopoly, like to the end, where it was like clear someone was like the tycoon that was winning it all, and you actually played it out till everybody was broke and gone? You always went to the end. You never stopped prematurely. No. Wow. I I have a confession. I've never played it fully to the end. Oh, cool. Ever. Because no matter who's winning, there's such a dominant monopoly, if you will, <laughs> in the game that it's like there is no point in, in a way of playing out the extra moves. And I guess you could say that the person that has won 
would benefit. There's a point because they feel very validated about all their hotels and all their, you know, houses and all their monopolies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I've never actually Ooh. completed a game of Monopoly. Really? Yeah. No, I guess when you get in there, you have to, have to finish it, even though it's painful. Of course, I'm losing. Uh, that's part of the game, right? Like. I suppose now that I know ERP, I'm just going to make that joke. Like, I guess I could do it, right? <laughs> it's a little a little psych humor there meets Monopoly. <laughs> no, we'll, 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 we'll finish the game for sure. And it... I, I feel like just the group I played with, I probably played the most with my family growing up. But I feel mm -hmm. like the groups I've played with are like, so-and-so won, we declare them the winner, let's move on. I've never had a group being like, no, to the end, we're going to make it to the end. Will I ever get out of jail or whatever it is? <laughs> like, Got it. So interesting. I have finished a game of Monopoly Junior, and I used to play that one in session sometimes when I was in grad school internship and all that stuff but yeah i've never the full the full-blown version well fred this is so wonderful thank you for being a good sport and answering some of my fun questions if we have time at the end we can revisit but today we're going to talk about inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy otherwise known as icbt and if you live in the united states this is really growing momentum as of late really in a grassroots way a lot of clinicians and and folks building excitement about this but outside of the united states icbt has been well researched and building really quite a plethora of research to help validated as a treatment protocol for the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder. And so here at the OCD Family Podcast, we're talking with families, we're talking with loved ones that are trying to support their people and impacted by OCD. And so I'm really curious because you're one of the co-founders of ICBT. That's a pretty big deal, you guys. We have Fred, one of the co-founders here. And he told me you could call him Fred. Look at us on a first name basis. So what brought you into research for OCD and the development of ICBT? Would love to hear that story a little more. Okay. So that, that's a long while back. Yeah. And that's all the way back to the 90s when I was studying psychology and doing my master. Mm -hmm. Internship doing therapy. I was trained in ERP initially, but I was doing an internship with my supervisor at the time, which was Professor Paul Amalcom. He was sort of one of the pioneers in research on OCD and also actually one of the pioneers in comparing cognitive therapies mm -hmm. with, with behavioral therapies. Yeah. Like ERP and cognitive therapy at the time was, was all kinds of things, but it also included like rational emotive therapy. Mm -hmm. and they found in those early studies, which were actually done in the eighties already. Mm -hmm. or, before my time, that they found that, that these cognitive therapies actually work quite well, and similar to ERP. Now, later, these studies have been criticized a little bit because the, they were not as controlled as they are now. But that sort of research has been replicated over time. Mm -hmm. But either way, that was sort of my background. I was trained in ERP. I was interested in cognition. And at the same time, in the 90s, we saw this sort of like cognitive explanations for OCD starting to come up in a real way. But there were different cognitive explanations for OCD, apart from just the behavioral one that's maintained by reinforcement. You have to expose yourself to the better. Everybody was sort of looking in that direction. A lot of researchers, you had the obsessive compulsive cognitions working group at a time, a consortium of researchers, and they were all looking at ways to see how cognition could be maybe incorporated into therapies for OCD. Yeah. And I was in the middle of that through my professor, I'm doing my internship, doing research as well as therapy at the same time. So we had access to a whole bunch of questionnaires that measured the variables that for the first time were being put together mm -hmm. one sort of big questionnaire in order to identify which the variables would really relate mm -hmm. since of OCD, which, which would be worked well, maybe specific to OCD, that we could sort of incorporate into a treatment where you're not only dealing with a behavioral treatment, you're actually dealing with a real cognitive behavioral treatment with a big C. With a big C. Yeah. Well, and can I pause you right there too? Because yeah. I think you're making two really important distinctions, which I think from being in the treatment world, I'm pretty aware of, but for any of our newer listeners, they may be less familiar with. You're distinguishing between the behavioral therapy and the cognitive therapy 
as well as cognitive with the big C. And so could you explain that in a way that would help maybe some of our family that's tuning in today understand what that difference means? Right. So so when you look at, at a behavioral treatment like ERP, mm -hmm. mainly looking at to effectuate change, to improve symptoms, to behavior. Yeah. I mean, that's your target, it's your main treatment target, mm -hmm. ERP which includes like exposing yourself to situations that you fear mm -hmm. and at the same time preventing the rituals from occurring, mm -hmm. which has a beneficial effect in terms, even though we don't, do not exactly know why that is. Right. The exact mechanism of change are, are still quite unclear. But that's a behavioral therapy which was developed all the way in the 1950s, 1960s. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to work quite well for contamination and checking. It was first used there. And it still does work very well. Mm -hmm. It's an, not for everyone, but it's, it's an effective treatment as compared to where we were before, before the fifties and sixties was a uh, very low hope for those with OCD, mm -hmm. but it had limitations, which, which became apparent already in the seventies at NAFOA, even uh, together with my, my professor at the time, uh, polemical, the wrote a book, failings and behavior therapy, you no, know, was recognized that, that it was not perfect and uh, that there is room for approval. And that's why our, these this more cognitive focus came from. Maybe, maybe it's not just behavior that we should be focusing on. What's the idea? Maybe we also should be looking at cognitive factors that may be maintaining or, or play an important role in the development mm -hmm. of OCD. So there were different theories around the main theory, but almost all these theories were embedded in the idea that, that we all have sort of intrusive thoughts, mm -hmm. which can develop into obsessions, depending on how we appraise them, how we react. Mm -hmm. There were different models of focus on appraisal of responsibility, some involved on some uncertainty or more perfectionism, but they all sort of basically come down to how we interpret these, these intrusive cognitions, mm -hmm. which start out normal and they become obsessions depending on how we react to them. That's was something that we were looking at at the time. We had all these questionnaires, etc. Now, how did they actually got into ITBT? Here in 1995, first article on the inference-based approach, as it was called, because it was not a therapy, it was called an approach, mm -hmm. approach to approach you. It was written by Kieran O'Connor in Canada, in Montreal, which I did not realize at the time that he was from Montreal. Oh. When it was in Montreal, we started working together. It was the other co-founder of Isolate. Small world. Yeah. The yeah. other co-founder <laughs> happened to be in town, yeah. now in town. Yeah. So I was already interested in 1996. And I said, okay, we are looking at all, we're developing this question. Yeah, we're looking at all this. This came from the obsessed compulsive cognitions working group. We wanted to administer them to people to see which type of cognitions would relate to symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I read an article of Kieran O'Connor. I thought like, wow, this is different. Mm -hmm. This is not also really developing from intrusive cognitions, normal faults, depending on how you crazy them. He said. Or actually reasoning processes that occur before an obsessional doubt, as he called it. Mm -hmm. Lymph, actually, at the time he called it. And our reasoning processes that, that, that precede it does not come out of the blue. Not just the appraisal of the fact. It's there's something not entirely right with these thoughts to begin with. And he, he based that on, on conversations mm -hmm. with, with the patients, which is Quite simply, when you ask a person, why do you believe that your hands are contaminated? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that the door may be hard? Why do you think that you may offend God? Mm -hmm. Or whatever obsession is, or obsessional doubt, I should say. Mm -hmm. They call reasons. Mm -hmm. They have a story behind them. They have a story about germs. They have a story about locks that get broken. They have a story about how they think. So there are reasons to be hiding. Nothing comes out of the blue. That's the whole story. Mm -hmm. I was obsession and he identified the process, the particular process in that, in these stories, mm -hmm. which is to, to formulate it, ICBT has evolved since then. But what this process is mainly about is a reasoning that's characterized by a distrust of the senses, mm -hmm. a distrust of the self, an over reliance on the imagination and the incorporation of all kinds of out of context facts and associations in these stories. Mm -hmm. The, the, the stories themselves are not raw. Stories themselves are not incorrect. Mm -hmm. the, the facts like Jordan Jack says, yeah, sure. If that's your justification for your doubt, uh, mm -hmm. uh, locks get broken mm -hmm. or 
correct. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. But how the person with OCD applies to it in the here and now is problematic. Yeah. And that it leads to an actual obsession. So there we are. We have two different models. Mm-hmm. First based approach, we have the person based model, and we have this purely behavioral model. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it was extremely interesting. Mm-hmm. I thought I was about to administer the question now to around 300 people. Mm-hmm. And I would have to write some items, some questions mm-hmm. that relate to this reasoning process, okay. and they incorporated them last minute. Mm-hmm. And that was the first empirical study into an inference based approach to OCD. 1999. Wow. So you've said a, a couple of really important things. And really, since I've started learning about ICBT in December of 2022, I've started incorporating a lot more. Even as I'm learning, no matter what my episode's about, I have some kind of nod to ICBT in it if it's not specifically even about ICBT like this episode. And so if people want to learn more, Certainly, ICBT.online is going to talk a lot more about this model. There's also a lot of really helpful infographics there, which is so helpful when you're trying to learn something that's complicated based in not behavioral change, but in that cognitive reasoning process. Sometimes it's just easier to see how that can map out in an infographic. And so there's those resources over at ICBT.online as well. As you can look at past podcasts here, at the OCD Whisper, at OCD Stories, a number of other podcasts and other sources that have been learning about that. But one of the things you said, and it's such a hard thing to like truncate down into like a little bite because it's so dense, this model, but I think you did a great job of it. And I just want to reemphasize it for the fam here. You talked about the distrust of your senses in the here and now. And so you emphasize two things. You emphasize the story behind the obsessional doubt and how the development of OCD includes a person distrusting what's happening in the here and now. So locks could break is different than I see a broken lock right in front of my face, right? But if I think I see a normal lock that's always locked the way it is, and I think, but what if it's actually broken? then I'm not trusting what my eyes are taking in right in this moment. And so what you talked about, too, when we were talking a little bit about the behavioral therapy, you were saying, we're not sure why it works, but it works. We're not sure how that mechanism works. What you're describing here from ICBT really is that there is a mechanism. There is a reasoning process. Can you talk more about that? Yes. Well, I mean, ERP are also reasoning processes. There are also, in your field, there are also processes that are identified and processes that they think are involved, you know, and the resources are going in the same way, but I'm just saying it's not in the same way for ICBT. It's not definite. Yeah. I do think some of the research that we're having does indicate that the inferential confusion plays an important role as a mechanism of change. That's what we call it, right? And we call it inferential confusion. Uh-huh. Call it the confusion because what we're really dealing with, when we're talking about these reasoning processes, we're talking about a confusion between, and this might get a little bit complicated, but we're talking about a confusion between abstract possibility and what is really a probability based in the sense. Right. There are all kinds of possibility, right, in, in our lives. We don't consider them all to be relevant, like the example we shall have to give, or like in therapy. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's possible that a meteor lands on my head right now, mm-hmm. or it's possible that the ceiling comes down on me right now. Well, that would be well, really unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, it, definitely. I, it's, it's unlikely, but, but it's also more than just unlikely. It's sort of an abstract possibility because there's nothing in the sense or nothing in the current context of my life to justify that it's relevant, right? Mm-hmm. So you have no, with no prediction of meteor showers. I don't see any huge cracks in the ceiling. I don't hear anything, you know. So possibilities in themselves do not cause OCD. Mm-hmm. Would be the case then everybody who would, would, would accept the fact that things are possible. Right. But would have OCD because we all readily accept that. But something else is going on in OCD, according to an inference based approach. Something very different, which is that a person creates a story that makes these possibilities into a relevant consideration in the here and now. Mm-hmm. And that is the reasoning, mm-hmm. the probability, let's say. Mm-hmm. So that's 
distinction between abstract possibility and, and, and real probability. And that is done by reasoning. And this reasoning is characterized that we go back to this distrust of the senses, a distrust of uh, the self, and over reliance on the imagination, which forces imagination to be superimposed mm -hmm. on reality. Mm -hmm. It, it leads to a, a confusion between reality and possibility. And suddenly, what should just maintain, or what should just be an abstract possibility with no emotional relevance, with no, with no intensity to it, just abstract like, like any other possibility that the other word brush aside is no relevant. That's what causes this enormous intensity. Mm -hmm. It's strong. People are also being strong. It's not what's talked about, the intensity of obsessions, unfortunately. But it creates this enormous absorption, which will, should be just an abstract possibility into something that becomes very real to the person in the here and now. In that sense, acting upon compulsions is the most natural thing in the world you can do. Right. Yes. It was a real probability, you know? Mm -hmm. There is a real danger, no matter how small, mm -hmm. actually relevant to the here and now. Right. Children may be in danger. That my loved ones may be in danger. It's a natural instinct to act upon. The problem is that you're acting on what is no more than an abstract possibility. The thought should not even come up. It's not a matter of accepting your thought, it's not a matter of accepting the uncertainty. Thought should not even be there. Yeah. It's not relevant to the here and now. The problem is you make it relevant through a story that you tell yourself. That's the issue. That's the crux of what we call inferential confusion. And there's a lot more to say about that, obviously. Yeah. But that's the crux of it. Yes. And Fred, you, you with Karen and O'Connor wrote the treatment manual, right, for ICBT. That is a dense read, <laughs> but you're working on a self-help version of that that will be a little easier to digest. But yes, the concept of inferential confusion is really confusing, shall we say. Fair. <laughs> it's hard to wrap your mind around, right? Mm -hmm. so, but that's, that's also... That's also its strength in a way, because if you resolve your inference or confusion, you also resolve your OCD. And that's what makes ICBT, this the treatment of therapy, one person called it a therapy of realization. It's a therapy that actually tries to resolve OCD, resolve an upset, but you have to be careful with that word, right? Yes. Res resolving OCD in, in a real way, which is going back to reality, not by going deeper into the OCD, which makes things worse, let's say. Luckily, call going into the OCD bubble. No, right. Many people with OCD are very familiar with what it feels like, which is a terrible feeling. What we want is to bring right. people back to what it is in the here and now by seeing that there is no real evidence in the here and now that justifies these concerns that you have. Standing in front of the stove, you see it's all. That's it. Nothing else to do. Go back to reality. You don't have to accept the fact that it may still be on. You don't have to accept that uncertainty at all. You know that you have to stay out. Not only out of all shows, actually out of the doubt. There's no mixed message yourself. You have to expose yourself to the doubt, you know, re into the anxiety. In ICBT, there's none of that. You have to stay out of it altogether. Why can you stay out of it altogether? Why is it possible? Because reality is your best friend. Right. Yeah. Reality bites, but it is also... So if it's real, but that's the whole thing with obsession. Really? Right? Yeah. It bites a lot more when you are in this thought loop where you're living in the land of imagination. I tend to think in analogies quite a bit. And an image I just got, I really have always loved since learning, always, in these last eight, ten months, always, I've loved this way of describing the OCD obsessions as absorbing. But even though I've heard that many times as you were talking, I started thinking about it even in a visual way, like a sponge, right? So if we had water on our desktop here, and if I took the sponge and I absorbed the water in it, now there's no more water on the desktop, right? But it's all being held in the sponge. And often in obsessional thoughts, in these obsessional doubts, we are getting absorbed into the sponge. And it feels protective, right? Because we're all up in the sponge now, right? I'm not on the tabletop. I'm in the sponge. But the reality is when you're absorbed, you're also moving completely out of this present of I can see the water, it's right there, and you are sucked in and literally dissociated in to the sponge over here. Now, if I wring out that sponge, I know 
from my history of exposures to sponge and life and living and all the things that I could wring out some water. But if I didn't wring out the water, then the water could dry up, right? Like, I also know how all of that can function. And when we're living in the sponge, then we're not out here in the present. We can't gauge things by the reality of what's happening in the here and now. And certainly there are times where things are happening and they're bad in the here and now. So, yeah, feel bad about that. Be like, oh, my gosh, I don't like that, right? There's war going on. Ooh, don't like that. We get in a car accident. 10 out of 10, don't recommend. All of those things in the here and now, we can deal with that in the here and now. But when we're getting absorbed into the possibility that that could happen, not that it did happen, but it could happen, literally anything could happen. And 100 or 200 years ago, you could have said, hey, see that that dot up there in the sky and it moves around? It's the moon. I'm going to go there. I'm going to build a machine that can go there no matter how far away it is. You'd be like, this person has lost it, right? The imagination can do really powerful, amazing things. It built that machine. It blasted people to the moon. We have satellites. We've learned so much because of that. But that same brain, braining, that brought all this innovation, when it's applied to possibility, which can be great and it can be very scary and dark, it can be so absorbing. And so I like the model because it's almost like regaining a love to yourself because you're learning to trust yourself again and you're going, okay, no, what I see with my eyes, what I smell, what I hear, what I feel, what I taste, what's going on now, I can trust that. So if that's a hard thing, then I can mourn that. If that's a great thing, I can celebrate that. I don't have to live in the sponge, which is great. Right. You can. That's a great analogy. And, and the whole point is that, that by going into the sponge, you're, you're moving away from what is there in the here and now. You're moving away from reality. The trick of the OCD is, and that's what makes it so hard for people to get out of the sponge, the OCD convinces them that they are actually dealing with reality. Right. Well, not, you know, and how does OCD do that? Again, through all kinds of these reasoning traits that are embedded in these wider processes, like a distrust of the senses. You know? How do you distrust the senses? How does OCD do that? It will tell you to go into the invisible. So it will say like, well, I see my hands are clean. I know I just washed them. But what if I missed this part? Because what if there's something that I cannot see? You know? It goes beyond what is there all the time. Constructed that way, OCD does it on purpose. Mm-hmm. Not that it's actually always wrong that there are not inappraisable things, but the OCD keeps you in that loop by constantly alluding to the invisible. It does that with other forms of OCD, like stall, you know, I mean, I don't see it, but who knows, something may be broken inside, or maybe gas coming out, who knows, whatever. Right. But you see how always the arguments of the OCD are never directly through what is perceived, really. Mm-hmm. It's almost always has to rely on the invisible. Mm-hmm. What is the invisible? Oh, visible is the invisible. Mm-hmm. That's where the strength of the OCD is. And that's, that's why OCD is so absorbing. Because you think your imagination relates directly to the world around you. And your OCD tells you you're still really in the world. But you're not. You're only going deeper into your imagination. Right. You actually think you're going deeper into reality by thinking about all these things that are invisible around you. But you're going deeper into your imagination. And that creates this enormous absorption. Maybe absorption is part of it, you know, and, and also a sense of dissociation sometimes. People with OCD experience that I know this makes no sense. I cannot feel anything differently. Like, what is happening? They don't know what is happening. They can't help themselves. Yeah. Because that's the, again the confusion. They don't realize they're in the imagination entirely. And, and that's the problem. That's what we try to keep them out of by the realization that you don't have to go there. No need to go there at all. Yeah. So you're making a really important point for anybody who is new to this or currently involved in exposure and response prevention therapy. It's really hard to wrap your mind around. And you've already alluded to this, but why do you think there is so much interest in this approach? You've highlighted that you don't need to do the exposures, but many things I will hear from clients in the general community is, well, if it was a matter of me just not doing the compulsion, obviously I've tried doing that. And I would do that if I could. And this is the only thing that can keep me from doing the compulsion is something like ERP. 
So can you explain why do you think there's interest in this approach? And I know you've already talked about it in terms of the cognitive process, but like, how do we get away with not having to do exposures in ICBT if we can't control the fact that we can't not compulse if we're in a thought loop, right? How do we do that? How does that work? Simple so, question, right? Easy. <laughs> no, no, but, but it's fine. I mean, it's, it's a good question because we, uh, inevitably all this comes up. Yeah, so ICBT does not include ERP. Let's be clear about that. Mm-hmm. There's no ERP, which is a technique that consists of purposely and deliberately exposing yourself to an uh, obsessional situation in order to do anxiety mm-hmm. and in order to create a learning experience from that, while at the same time not engaging in uh, compost. That's the ERP. Right? And mechanism, there's still debate about the actual mechanisms behind it, but that's ERP, particular technique, behavioral technique. Now, ICBT is pharmacologic, pharmacologic, and it does not include ERP. It does include behavioral aspects of behavioral interventions to some extent. That's mm-hmm. why we call our first based cognitive behavioral therapy. It has both, the, both these traditions in there, mostly cognitive, but it has some behavioral element. Now, when it comes to comparing, like stopping your compulsions, what does that mean in ICBT? Mm-hmm. ICBT, that means that we want the person to realize that they're unnecessary to begin with. But if, if you have the certainty that, that your hands are clean, if you have the certainty that these doubts that you have are 100% irrelevant to the here and now, mm-hmm. naturally the urge should not be there to start with. You know? So in a way, ICBT, there's no response prevention in ICBT. ICBT prevents the response prevention of a needle. Yeah, yeah, totally. And you said something that I think is going to like put people in a like tailspin of what if they're currently already in a behavioral approach like ERP? You said if you have certainty, because the whole thing, the whole thing, I mean, I'm not reducing it all to this, but this is pretty foundational within ERP is that you have to embrace uncertainty because there is uncertainty. Well, it's not foundational at all. I would argue against that. I would mean, you? Let's, I'm thinking of that meme. Have you ever seen the meme of like, tell me that I'm wrong. And it's on like a, <laughs> a guy at a, like a flip-flop table. Oh, I'm going to defend your clear. Go for it. Fact that it is a very effective treatment, but it's not about intolerance uncertainty that has been wheeled in later on as this sort of like in the US or particularly like you have to embrace uncertainty. ERP is about tolerating uncertainty. No, ERP is about, about facing your peers. Behavior has a very powerful effect on our cognition, but can be quite helpful from my perspective. Problem is not everybody can do that and not everybody's benefiting from it either. Mm-hmm. But the idea that ERP is just about tolerating to uncertainty, that's the idea of intol- that those with OCD are characterized by intolerance to uncertainty, but you're tolerant. Then have more tolerant, then it will be better. But there's no evidence that those with OCD are actually intolerant to uncertainty any more than anybody else with another anxiety. I it's w- not specific to OCD. So you can reel that into yeah. a rationale or ERP, which absolutely don't need to do so. And it never used to be that way either. Yeah. You know, I guess I'm getting old, but I remember that it did not used to be that way. There are all sorts of different rationales to have a person do exposure, reality testing, experiential learning. Those are different rationales than saying, now we're going to, going to improve your ability to tolerate uncertainty. That's, that's just a variation that has for some reason become extremely popular in the U S without the science to back it up. Ooh, that's a loaded statement, Fred. But (laughs) he's like, well, (laughs) but what I will say is I appreciate And I think this is becoming more reflective and there's more intention, at least, for it to expand within the research. But it's important to appreciate the cultural differences because you're highlighting, and that is my exposure, for lack of a better word, is ERP via learning in the U.S. But there is a lot of emphasis. I wouldn't say that it's the only thing. But it is pretty foundational in a U.S. operational definition of OCD to say, we're going to embrace uncertainty. We're not going to have this. I totally agree with you that it's not like this person just has a weird broken brain around certain certainties or uncertainties and not on others, which is part of the attraction, I think, of ICBT. I think it's really validating to be like, no, it's not that your brain 
is broke in the way that it can reason logic because your brain reasons logic in so many powerful ways. A lot of people I've met that have had OCD are some of the smartest people I've ever met. I mean, they're bright. These aren't people that are like just broken and having these weird Swiss cheese kind of airs here, but not here, right? Like where there's holes randomly and we just don't know why. And so I agree with that. And I think that when I was mentioning the mechanism earlier, I think that when I'm operationalizing, and this could just be my error and how I'm saying it from a layman's perspective, but I don't see the mechanism of why certain things are intrusive and not, and we have intrusive thoughts that we can let go of and then certain ones stick. I love about ICBT that it talks about inferential confusion and this vulnerable self theme of the feared possible self, which is why this inferential confusion is making such an impact in the imagination, in the land of possibility here. And so I think it is interesting because the functional certainty, which we do teach about when we're doing ICBD treatment, is so counter to what, at least here in the States, most people are going to be hearing. But you make a really good point about considering the cultural considerations. And I think even here in the States, the <laughs> researchers are like, yeah, we've got some pretty white westernized treatment protocols for a lot of things right? Not just OCD. And so we do need to consider, we need to embrace the cultural lens because all people are affected by OCD. All people are affected by different medical things, mental health things. And we need to be mindful of how that can manifest and look different culturally as well. And so I appreciate that you bring that up. Embracing the certainty is not possible for everyone, you know? And luckily with OCD, you don't have to, you know, for a person with scrupulosity. Uh, it's it's going to be difficult to say I have to accept these doubts. In ICBT, I don't have the problem really because it's value free from the, from the get go. Because, because the doubt is wrong to start with. So if you have this thing, I know planning a fault all the time. No, you're not a friendly dog. You're, you're imagining it. Yeah. That, that's the problem. Right? So ICBT transcends a lot of these cultural difficulties that you may encounter otherwise in treatment. And there's interest from the religious groups in ICBT as well, exactly for that reason. You know? Yeah. And that sort of happened automatically because of how we conceptualize OGD as obsessional doubts that are incorrect and wrong to start with. Yeah. But yes, this is vulnerable self theme as well. It sort of explains a little bit like why you develop obsessions in one area of life, not in other areas of life, right? So in ICBT, we emphasize the notion of the self yeah. and that of the self in particular, which is the self we don't want to be or we don't want to become, you know? Yeah. So if you have some kind of intrinsic fear of it might be a lack of a person, or my person who's lying to myself, or might be a person who's not being honest with myself, whatever your vulnerability or fear is, mm -hmm. that will, will play a part in, in which kind of obsessions, type of obsessions you start to develop. It's not a cause for OCD, which lies more in the, in the concept of inferential confusion, but it sort of guides it, the direction in which you're not going to have a Sessions, it's probably going to be somewhere in the area that hits when it hurts, right? Yeah. It's when it hurts the most. It doesn't just go into something you just don't care about. No, it goes exactly in the thing that you care about the most. Yeah. You know, to that point, so I'm not like a research aficionado. I've done some classes in it. I tried to read it and I feel like I've absorbed, <laughs> for lack of a better term, some uh, information and learning about it, but I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I am an aficionado. However, that was something that was hard for me when I was learning about you know, we talk a lot, especially if you utilize something like ACT to augment your treatment and ACT being acceptance and commitment therapy. We talk a lot about value-driven goals and we talk about where people with OCD get caught is usually what they value the most, their relationships, their faith, their sexuality, their safety, other people's safety, right? And so I never understood how Everybody gets intrusive thoughts, but the only ones that are sticking, Fred, are the ones that directly hit your values. Now, again, I'm not a research aficionado, but we are batting 300. I think that's really good. Let me use an analogy I understand. We should be playing the lottery, y'all. 
with how good we are with the odds if everything we value ends up being what really feels triggered within OCD because it can't be both ways. It can't be completely randomized and be hitting every single value marker, right? And so I I didn't know how to make sense of that, but I did know that the treatment, as you've said, it can and does work and it has a lot of research behind it. That being said, that doesn't work for everybody. And there are folks specifically that wouldn't even try whether it would help them or not because the idea of exposing themselves to their worst possible fears and not doing their safety behavior, thought, feeling, whatever it is, ritual, what we would call in the field compulsions, is terrifying. And they're like, you know what? I would rather live in this small, shrinking world of mine then risk the possibility that this could come true. And so some people are never going to try ERP for that reason. And so ICBT, because it's not exposure-based, it lands very differently for folks. And like you said, it's not a perfect fit, just like ERP is not a perfect fit. If it was, OCD would be cured and I would not have a podcast. But I would love if I didn't have a podcast for that reason because OCD wasn't torturing people. But there is no quote unquote cure, right? There is no big solve, but this is an option and it doesn't involve exposure. That is a pretty enticing thought, especially for people that are like, I can't even consider treatment because I'm so crippled by the fear. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the point, right? That's how also we started with, you know, like not everybody can do exposure. So what do you do then, right? Not that many options there. talk all you want, but if a person is terrified, they're not going to do it, right? So ICBT provides an alternative that does not include exposure, but it is also our research shows now is as effective yeah. and not practically effective. There are no cures there, unfortunately. We're still dealing with whether it's ERP or ICBT, we're still dealing with like 40 to 50% remission, people will reach remission. Great for the people who reach remission, mm-hmm. and not so great for the people who don't, you know, mm-hmm. that's the real facing. Look, that's something we still have to improve on. It may be possible if the following would be true, which is that different treatments have different effects on different people. Right. So what may not work for the 150% may work for the other 50%. We don't know that. Here. That is something we are starting to look into. And then we're actually moving towards something that's maybe more of a personalized medicine, right? Yeah. Where OCD is not cancer, but let's say... You want to die also with that. I don't know, look at what is the best treatment for you. Give them a specific or dog case, you know? Yeah. And something else, depending on whatever genetic marker is or whatever, whatever is involved there, it will depend on your type of cancer. Now, this type of personalized medicine, I think, oh, in the future is something we are going to move toward for. And hopefully that will also in more and more people finding their cure, even though there's not a cure. Mm-hmm. But right now, when we're at, in terms of ERP versus ICBT, both are similarly affected. But one doesn't include exposure. And what we're finding evidence for is that, that probably for the reason, ICBT is more easier to tolerate and more accept. So it gives an option not only for those who don't want to do ERP, but also perhaps for those who haven't responded well to ERP before, even though they're doing everything. Yeah. Like, I was sharing with you last week, we were chatting, and I'm a person at this point, subclinical OCD, but I'm a person with lived experience. Both have worked for me and both have their values, right? And for a chunk of people, maybe both are going to work or medication support is going to work or a combination of the three at different seasons within their life. For some, only one's going to work or the other. And for some, none of that's going to work. And we're going to have to continue optimizing what is going to be the best treatment strategy for them. And so I I appreciate that you brought up the personalized medicine because we were talking about that last week, too. And what's tricky is for researchers, you have to protect the variables you're testing so that you can ensure the results or outcomes I'm getting. This data is a result of either this variable being there or not. Right. But we live in a fishbowl where rarely, rarely, I can't even really think of an example. Are we not impacted by multiple variables at all times, right? And so for the research to be able to claim this factor makes a difference, it has to really be specific in making sure there's not other confounding variables impacting that. 
for everyday living, why does something work for some people and some people not? I mean, I think we've all heard those stories, whether it's shared on Facebook. I'm old, so Facebook is about as social media, like, savvy as I get. <laughs> I don't snap. I don't do all the things. I'm not on Discord. But what I would say is, in terms of, like, we all hear a person swears by this and they're going to share about it because it really worked for them. Did it work for them? Was it a coincidence? Were there multiple other variables? Often the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Yes, it worked for them, but yes, it could have been because of another reason. And yes, there were lots of other variables because this is real life, right? And so it is important to be able to optimize. It's also important to be able to say, like, there's a reason that the blue dawn works for removing grease and can even be used when there's oil spills and waters and there's wildlife and it's gentle. But it also will clean your lasagna platter, right? Like, we want to be able to know the difference between that and some other crap that isn't going to do the job, right? But then again, like you said, it's not a cure. It's not the fix all. And so really personalizing that, the research is going to have to limit the factors so that they can prove one way or another this variable makes a difference or it doesn't. When it comes to life, optimizing our treatment plan is going to include more than just one thing. And so being able to look at that and have more options, if the one thing is the only thing, right, which is what for OCD it's been for a while, at least here in the States, and I would argue medication and there's been studies on deep brain stimulation and all sorts of other things, but it's the the gold standard. My analogy here is there's more than one kind of gold out there. I'm a woman. I like jewelry. I will admit there's rose gold, there's white gold, there's yellow gold, and all have different values. Some might be like, I don't care what kind of gold. I love gold. Some people are going to be like, I'm a strictly one type of gold person. Okay. But having more options makes a difference. So you were speaking to the research and where the research started really in the 90s for ICBT. Can you talk about the current state of the research and really where you see it going from here? Right. Well, let me jump quickly through that because what we already did is we conducted a lot of studies which has shown a certain specificity of addressing confusion through OCD, which Mm -hmm. I think is important, right? Yeah. So when I was talking about this study that we did in the 90s, we actually found that these inference process is one of the best predictors of symptoms of OCD. Now, that's not one measure, but I continue with that. And we started developing questionnaires using different methodologies. And we found a good body of evidence that told us, this is never just one study, right? You're using different methodologies and it all comes together as a body of evidence where you say, okay, that inference and confusion seems to be important in OCD. It is something important to target and treatment. We developed the treatment, you mm-hmm. know, started with first treatment manual because by the time it was permanently in Canada, it was in 2000, it was doing a lot of work in terms of treatment, clinical work at the time, but also the research. That's when I started then with Kieran O'Connor in person yeah. together. And we started writing the first manual. We actually debated for a while, what are we going to call this therapy, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was not insurance-based therapy first. So, mm-hmm. uh, we didn't really, it was an insurance-based approach within a cognitive behavioral framework. Mm-hmm. So I think the first manual was, which I wrote in 2003, the title I had professional, the title was Therapy of the Imagination. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, which, which in many ways it still is, you know? Yeah. Or you can call it doubt therapy as well. Doubt yeah. therapy. Yes. Because it's the doubting disorder. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, in the end, we settled on the more boring term uh, <laughs> of first based cognitive behavioral therapy. But I mean, it captures as well, but it has a lot more depth. It's not an intellectual affair, right? I see what is not intellectual. It's, it's quite the opposite. Mm-hmm. Trying to get all these cognitions in order to be who you really are. Yeah. It is not that it takes no effort. Being takes no effort. You no, know? it's just the OCD makes things more complicated than they have. That should be like on a fortune cookie for a being takes no effort. Although sometimes being feels like a lot, right? But like you said, I, I like how you described that. That's another one I'm going to have to chew on. <laughs> we try to ultimately get people to, to get to, right? And we talk about reality sensing. That's one of the things we go in there. One of the things in ICVT, trying to get people back to a state of no effort. And we get to that state. Without these doubts that you continuously create new stories. Yeah. With uh, imagination. You know, when I was first learning uh, about ICBT, I bought the manual. I was like, what? I'm sorry. I don't get it. 
And then I started watching videos and leaning into colleagues that were chatting about it. And I ended up on the podcast having a chat with Mike Hetty. And one of the ways he described what I feel like you're describing right now. So correct me if I'm off. But he talked about that common sense reality. Like you don't have to take effort to compute it. Just like I don't have to take effort to know that the light is on in my room or that the sun is shining because I can see you in the natural light in your room, right? I don't have to sit there and be like, but how do I know that? I see a light bulb and it is illuminated and it has this many lumens and this is a process. I just know it's on and I don't think about it. I, I just take that for granted. And so what you're talking about, because some folks I think will hear life doesn't take effort for doing. They're like, my life takes so much effort and I'm out of spoons and I don't have energy to do anything, right? And so I would distinguish, it's like the common sense piece is really what you're speaking to, right? Is like, yeah. you don't have to analyze, is the light on? It's on. I can see it's on. You can see it's on. I have multiple lights on. There you go. It's kind of an overcast day. So I love natural light, but it's that great right now. Yeah. It's like a cognitive therapy that promotes the cognition or the unnecessary cognition. Yeah. So one of the things you said to me last week, and you made a point that you're not just a researcher, but you also have a scientist background, right? And so in looking at this, and again in science, so part of how, if I flub this up, correct me where I'm wrong, Fred, because again, not an efficient and not on research. But part of how research is validated is we go through the scientific method of repeating the experiment to make sure that there is a significant outcome. This wasn't just a fluke, random possibility. And we're trying to prove one way or another that this is the reasoning or this is the cause and effect that is creating this outcome, right? And so at the time, you would have read Karen and O'Connor's article back in the 90s and already involved and already have learned ERP research. That must have been, I know it was a mind bend for me to really absorb ICBT. And so sometimes you have to go, do I want to repeat this and think, does this have traction? Does this have legs? Is it worth really investing our time here? Or is where we're at what we know? So from a scientific perspective, just because I know you were telling me that you really come from that scientist background, and part of it might just be the intrigue of the something new, but how is it that you were like, you know what, I'm going to dive into this and I'm actually going to do that study that I'm working on now and we're going to test ICBT on it, which was IBA or the IB approach, <laughs> the inference-based approach at the time. How did you as a scientist take that leap? Because it is, it's a risk to say like, I'm going to take this that had this different outcome and say, is there traction to this or does this lead to a dead end and I come back over here? Yeah, I mean, there's a career risk in a short run, but otherwise, why would you be in science, right? You have to follow the evidence and you can't get to a test because otherwise you're not a scientist if you are. And from that being a scientist, then you should pick a different profession. It goes whether it's in ERP or in anything else. Unfortunately, we're human, so we do get attached, right? But yeah. That's why we have different scientists who debate with each other, which is a good thing. Oh. To keep each other honest, you know? I hope that is the case. We can all continue to speak freely in that way. But yeah, at the time, it, it definitely went against the, uh, well, still does, I guess. But it, it went against the general view of what OCD was about, both behavioral and cognitive, because of this idea of the developing the appraisal, sort of random fruits and thoughts, no particular reason behind them, not a reason of importance anyways, you know? Yeah. So yeah. It went against that. And at the same time, you had act sort of coming up in the early 2000s. You know, so you had that at the same time, which is still very much a similar model as the other ones. They get to sit with the doubt, right? So ICBT was radical in a way. If you can use that word, I don't think it's, it's radical really, but, but in that context, perhaps let's say, no, you can't reject obsession about it. You can reject them all together. There's nothing to sit with, nothing to do. Just hold them up all together. Nothing to accept, nothing to tolerate, nothing to whatever. Just reject them because they are constructed in a way that makes them well from the get. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was a message of how to get across and everybody was excited about all these other obsessive beliefs, which in the end did not come out as strongly uh, as was hoped, which was recognized. But then we got this whole turn back more towards ERP. Well, it seemed like cognitive interventions. So the role of initiative was not as strong as we had hoped. So 
people started reverting back to ERP more. And yes, I see we saw it in the middle of that, but we continue luckily we dash on them all the time. We continue, continue doing trials, continue to build up the evidence. Our trials, randomized control trials showed it was an effect treatment. We have multiple trials now. It's still ongoing. And then suddenly, I would say two or three years ago, it's before COVID and at the start of COVID, I was starting to get more emails from clinicians. People start asking consultancy, especially because with COVID, everybody got a little bit more interested in cognitive approaches because they were worried about doing ERP, even though I don't think there was much reason to, I think ERP works just as well during COVID as outside of it, but some said you have to be careful with ERP anyways, but it was an interesting cognitive approaches in that period. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought like, okay, we're going to have to do something more in terms of dissemination. Started a, a group online, remission, and before you know it, it started to grow like wildfire. Also, thanks to all the great clinicians that are in the group, inviting people to reach out to so was the first to organize meetings online where clinicians could learn from each other. Yeah. Um, like Patty Carl Robbins and many others started inviting people. People started to provide trainings in ICBT. Right. Right now, we're at uh, more than 2K. Uh, 1,000 members. Yeah. And we have a treatment. Finally, that's a little bit more available than it used to be before. There's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah. When I joined the group, I think it was something like 700 people international, a, a large, dense population from the U.S. because we are the ones more without information. So we're like, what? We want to learn. But there were like 700. And yeah, it hasn't even been a year that I've been a part of that group. And it is over 100% grown, right? You know, because it is. It's up in the 2000s now. And I see that continuing to grow. One kind of last thing, and then if you're game, I'll do some fun, silly questions again at the end here. But one last thing that I'm thinking of, I know there was an ICBT talk, and I talked about it here on the podcast in my roundup from the conference this year, but the International OCD Conference had a talk on ICBT and some acknowledgement of ICBT as a treatment option, but there was really one talk where there was a little more understanding from people that are practicing ICBT, sharing their experience of facilitating a treatment that's based on imagination. Yeah. And so one of the things, one of the comments that I heard, I would say was a common denominator across people that were very, and I remember being there. So I, I get it. It's radical, but it's not. Once you understand it, you're like, it is common sense. But before you get it, if you're really zoomed in in an exposure and response prevention world or just new to the diagnosis and you're just surviving, trying to stay above water here, it does sound and feel radical. But one of the things people said was ICBT actually is, if we look at it, a form of exposure because you're going and you're doing the things, you're living to your values that you wouldn't have done otherwise. And so it really is kind of an exposure model, which I don't agree that it's, a, I think it's radically different from an exposure model. And so what would you say to that to help folks understand? Because while I can see where behavioral folks may be coming from in that you're leaving the door and not coming back, that would have been the ERP exposure, but it's very different very, very different if you leave the door and not come back and don't even get to the compulsion, let alone the exposure, if you're in an ICBT model. So can you help distinguish that for our listening fam here? Because it is, it's hard to wrap your mind around if you've been already in the behavioral model. Right. Yeah. No, well, I mean, not everything is ERP, right? I mean, ERP is a technique that occurs in a particular context. I mean, I'm exposing myself now to a lot of people that person with OCD may fear watching a table or whatever it may be. Am I exposing myself? Am I practicing ERP now? No, because I don't have OCD. So you cannot say everything is exposure, you know, that's yeah. just how living, that's just normal living, you know? So I think that's sort of conflation between the two. Healthy living is automatically means you're out there in the world. You want to call that exposure? Okay, but it's not exposure as in ERP. Right. right. So it, it's not a, a valid argument to say that therefore ICBT is exposure. Another way to put it is that ERP sort of like tries to already create or put you in situations before you actually have taken care of the obsessional doubt. 
But as you see, it's the other way around. First, I take care of the obsessional doubt and all that anxiety, and then we go into the world without exposure, if you want to call it there, but it's just being in a little natural and normally. So that's the difference. Yeah. Sometimes I will say to clients, I tend to use this concept of the magician's trick quite a mm -hmm. bit, right? And so I talk to them about if you've ever been to a magic show, and even if you haven't, you've probably heard of this trick where a magician has a hat, get this, it's empty, and pulls a full ass rabbit, pardon my ass, out of that hat. And you're like, what? Because there was nothing in the hat and then there was something, right? And you go, how is that possible? Now, you and I know that there was some mechanism for maybe the hat's on a table and there's a false door and the rabbit's down there or whatever. It's not actually that the person materialized from one space to the other and had control over putting usually a top hat because it's nice and roomy for that rabbit <laughs> to come out of, right? And so from an ERP model, if we're engaging in compulsions and we are trying to help the brain learn a new behavioral response, then not engaging in the compulsions in these exposure trials is ultimately what can help bring the brain to new learning. So I could say like I'm in awe and I'm double checking if is a rabbit there but I actually can embrace whether the rabbit was there or not it doesn't matter right I'm gonna do my life right versus I don't have to do exposure if I understand the trick I don't have to go to 10 magic shows to decrease my distress scale I don't even have to go to any magic show it could be the rabbit trick or it could be completely different and I could go, this is an illusion. I, even if I don't know how it's done, I know it's an illusion. I know there's trickery involved. That resolves the doubt for me, right? And that's what ICBT has been able to do for, I think, a lot of people too. And so you could say, hey, I'm at the grocery store buying apples. And you're like, but you're kind of in an exposure because you're not watching a rabbit and looking for it coming out of a hat. And you're like, I'm also not killing people. I'm not spreading AIDS. I'm not doing like. Sure, there's a whole lot of things I guess we could classify by me picking an apple out of the produce department as an exposure. But no, this is me just, I'm not even having a second thought about the magician because I already get it. Seen that trick, been there, done that. Exactly. That's what they're trying to get people to watch, right? That there is no relevance to the doubt, that there is no anxiety. So when you do reality sensing and ICBT, you don't feel anxiety and and you don't have obsessional doubts, then you're doing it something right. You're doing exposure in ERP and you don't feel anxiety. You're probably doing something wrong because that's the whole idea, right? So, right, uh, right. So it's it's a whole different concept. I see the team tries to get ahead of all of that. So let's all explain. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm glad I'm explaining it well. If it's endorsed by Fred, I'm going to be like, actually, no big deal. Name drop Fred said that was a good analogy. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep going with that one. <laughs> From the man himself, from one of the co-developers himself. Okay, so I'm going to end with a few little fun questions then. And you have been gracious in sharing in the beginning and also just taking the time because I know you're super busy. So thank you, Fred. This has been fun. And I'm looking forward to learning a little more fun facts about you. Have you ever worked at a fast food restaurant? No. I did not. I never did. Not because I did not want to. Interesting. Uh, did you actually want to or were you indifferent to it? <laughs> I mean, people in North America don't really realize how in terms of like availability of jobs and work, uh, sure. it may not be the job you want, but at least there are ways to get a job often, you know? Yeah. In the Netherlands when I was a student or even before, 14 years old, it was not that easy finding a job. And Working in a burger joint, it was actually one of the top jobs at that level at the time. Oh. Uh, so what I did, I was just you know, doing paper routes and all that stuff. Okay, so, so you were a paper boy. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Uh, did you have like a bike or a car or I guess if you were 14. I, I bike. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Paper boys and newsboy is kind of like a thing of the past now with the electronic age because a lot of newspapers even are electronic. That is interesting. Well, I, I worked at a Burger King, so everyone can just be impressed. 
Yeah. We lived in a small town and it was like one of, it was like the new restaurant and one of three restaurants. So how about that? There were not a lot of options for me either. Okay. Have you ever gotten stitches? Yes. You yeah. have. Dare I ask, are you open to sharing the story of how you got the stitches? Uh, you know, so, well, I mean, it was a pretty bad one. I guess that's the more interesting stuff, right? So, right. no, I was actually on my bike and something got in between my wheels and I toppled over straight on my my hat. I still, I'm still missing a little bit of brown. I don't know. You can see it, but if you were yes. able to see it. I get, now that you've pointed out, I can see it. Us ladies, we know. If you do some brow work too much, that brow's not returning. So I get it. <laughs> there was some trauma in the brow area. I have yeah. never had stitches, but I have had lots of broken bones. My daughter has been eligible for stitches, though now they have surgical glue. So they're like, would you like stitches or surgical glue? And I'm like, I think we'll go with the surgical glue. Thank you. <laughs> That'll be easier, I think. How about this? Have you ever crashed a wedding? No, I cannot say that I have. No, I never crashed a wedding. Have you ever crashed a formal event where it was invite only, though? And you're like, I'm totally going. No, no, I can remember, actually. No, no I never wouldn't really occur to me to walk into uh, a private. You're like, why would I do that? I'm, you know why, Fred? Because you're still busy finishing the Monopoly game <laughs> earlier. <laughs> but if you don't finish Monopoly games, you have all sorts of time. I actually have crashed a wedding. So like in college, we had these people called RAs, residence assistants. They would kind of like oversee a group of people and try and keep an eye on them and whatever. And so the RA's roommate got married after we had graduated and some of my best friends were invited and they're like, you should just come. And she happened after college to start doing beauty pageants and she was Miss Michigan and she went on to like Miss America, which can go on in Miss Universe, all the things. And so I went to her wedding and I was like, I probably should not have gone A, because A, I was not invited. But B, if you go to a Miss America wedding, the bar is pretty high. You're like, nothing I ever do in life. I've peaked early. Nothing. It's going to be quite like this event again. It was it was quite the thing. But now that I've gotten married, I'm like, oh, my gosh, what an asshole. You know how much catering costs? That you would come and crash the wedding. So I have some new perspective. But I was just a kid back then. And I was like, sure, I'll get a free role. Whatever. It wasn't free. They pay way too much money for that role. Okay. So good for you. You follow the rules. He didn't have a lot of anxiety. Maybe this is why I had anxiety. Is because <laughs> I was crashing weddings and never completing my Monopoly game. Okay. How about one or two more? Are you game for one or two more? I love it. Okay. Have you ever pretended to be, I, I have a feeling, I feel like I'm getting to know you, Fred, well enough that I know how you're going to answer this. Have you ever pretended to be on the phone when you weren't to try and get out of a potential conversation? Oh, yes. I was going to oh. guess no, because you were like, the rule father, wait, tell me more. I'm, I'm so oh, excited. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, not so long ago, I did. Somebody coming by and then. On the phone. Yeah, you do the whole, like, it's like a charades, but everybody knows. <laughs> okay, because it's like a little white lie, right? Oh, it's just not in the mood, sorry. Just a little white lie. Yeah, no, yeah. I've totally done it. And I don't know about you, but, like, I think I've only done it, like, five times. And from a scientific perspective, you think I would have stopped because four out of the five times, the person waited for me to complete the phone call. They Ooh. really wanted to talk, barely. But one of those times, so in grad school, this was really funny. The grad school campus was small and this was in L.A. And so my gym happened to be on the other side. And if I was going to work out, I usually would just cut through campus. But then I would, it was a small campus and I would likely see people. And so cell phones were still fairly new at the time. And I was like, I'm just, I had a flip phone. I'm like, I'm going to be on the flip phone. So this guy waited to talk to me. And then when I turned off the flip phone, he was like, Nicole, you're faking a phone conversation, aren't you? So that you don't have to. Of course. But I was like, what? And then I was like, I totally am. That is totally what I'm doing. But nobody ever called me on it. So he was bold. But yes, yes, I've done that too. So yeah, I've, I've done all the things apparently. Except had stitches, but I've had a lot of broken bones. Okay, last one. Let me pick a good one. They're all good to me. Let's see. 
How about this? What would you do differently in life if nobody would judge you? So there weren't negative social consequences. What would you do differently in life? It's a big question. <laughs> wow. I mean, look, everybody who looks back on life sometimes thinks like, okay, I could have gone that off. I could have gone that far. One of the things early on, I had the choice to either go into science or I could have gone into something more manual. Uh -huh. And I guess without any social pressure, probably would have gone into something like construction. Oh, yeah. so you liked building things and right, it's not carpentry, that sort of stuff. And I still do that, you know, around the house, not not like a big hobby type of thing. Sure. But I had I had at one point that was definitely something that I wanted to do, and it's sort of like a fork of two direction I could go in at the time. Uh, yeah. But I chose science and really on already. That's how the system works in the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, basically start choosing already by the time you're 12 year old, depending on which type of school you go to. Yeah. So, uh, no, that would have been, but I'm, I'm happy where I met as well. Yeah, well, now. good. We're, we're happy too, Fred. Thank you for, <laughs> could you imagine if Fred went into like architecture or construction instead, we would all be exposing ourselves to magic tricks right now. <laughs> I'm right here. Yeah. We'd yeah. be like, I guess there's no alternative. Oh um, my gosh. That is so funny. Well, and not to downplay Kiernan and also would have probably still done what he did, but yeah, yeah. Interesting. So did you feel, I think it's 12 is early to know what you want to do with your life. And I guess it's similar. People feel like they have to pick a major now and it's a little more of something that I think the baby boomer here in the States, probably, I don't know if you guys use that term, probably not internationally, but people would stay in the same career forever. And nowadays, most people don't do anything related to the degree they actually attained. It's just kind of a gateway thing of having a bachelor's or a master's. It gets you in the door and then you can do anything. Right. Yeah. No, uh, in the Netherlands, it's, I don't know, it, it's like a schooling system. Like in England, they have the grammar school and they have uh, different type of schools, right? So right. Uh, that's why it happened so early in the Netherlands as well, because it's a similar system. I guess in, in the U.S. it's a little bit later, which is probably good, you know, because who knows a 12 year old what they really want to do, right? Yeah. But, uh, and it's good also to be able to switch if you don't like something, to be able to, to switch to another type of profession. Why not? Yeah. 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 It's good to have choices. Look at that full circle moment, Fred. We just had a full circle moment. It's good to have choices. You don't have to be married to that one choice. You can have multiple interests and you can make some big shifts. Also, depending on what's happening, for a lot of people crippled by OCD that would be afraid of doing exposure or maybe have felt a, a sense of loss of hope around life being any different, your world gets a lot bigger when some of that confusion is resolved. Your world gets a lot bigger when your brain learns new responses that opens up possibility. And so I love that people do have choices because they can grow and be in places where they would have never imagined they could do it before because they would have been too crippled by fear or doubts, intrusive thoughts, whatever way people are looking at it. And so, yeah, I think that's good. So, all right, construction worker Fred. That is very interesting and fascinating, and I appreciate all the time that you've taken. I don't even know how I would answer that question, by the way. I asked it, but I was like, for most of these, I feel like I know the answer. I don't know. I've always been fairly risk-averse, goody-two-shoe type person, and so I think I would be probably a lot more wild and risky if I didn't think there were consequences of it. That's big, but that's like the best I even know how to think about. What's there we have podcasts that can be risky as well, no? Well, that's true. Although it's been a fun journey. I don't know why. In the same way like you growing up, you're like, I wasn't really anxious. It doesn't really make me get anxious. And I feel like I could talk forever. If anything, my husband's like, thank goodness you have other people to talk to. Because after the pandemic, he was like, he's an introvert and he loves me. But he's like, you need 
new folks to chat with. <laughs> so I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. And we will look forward to continuing to see the research, the self-help book you're looking at. People can find you on Facebook in the ICBT treatment group or ICBT.online. Anything else that you would want to point folks towards that you're working on? Yeah, well, I would say like the ICBT group is, is for mental health professionals. I'm hoping eventually we also get more of a, a support group for people. I am working on a book too that I hope will make the therapy more widely available for maybe people who cannot afford therapy or... Yeah people uh, who want to do it on their own. So there are new things coming up. I'm also hoping that, that there are, and which I'm sure will happen, that more and more therapists will start to offer ICBT as yeah. well. So I would say it comes down to don't give up hope. If you have OCD, there is hope. OCD creates an illusion, but it's not real. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that's, that's hard to realize and hard to get to, but it is an illusion that's created by the OCD. Not the software that it creates. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that it's the suffering is based upon, and I hope that this therapy can help solving some of this real suffering that's created by this illusion of OCD. Yes. Yes. So folks, if there's a rabbit in the hat, that rabbit didn't appear out of nowhere. It's an illusion. Also, if you go to icbt.online, if you are a person or your loved one that is suffering from OCD, if you're going like, where could I even find somebody? that may be practicing this. There are more clinicians learning, but if you go to icbt.online, you can also look at a provider directory that's international. So it's not just in one specific area, it's all around, and that list is constantly growing. And so that's also a good resource for folks going like, I wanna find somebody that does ICBT. Sometimes people live in an area where they don't even do ERP, let alone ICBT. And so that can be, especially in this day and age with telemedicine, that can be a great resource too over at icbt.online. Oh, and the YouTube channel. You guys have a YouTube channel now? YouTube channel. There's a lot of information on there. So you can find the YouTube channel or the link. You can find it through the website, icbt. Yeah. Uh, dot online or, or I would definitely check that out. Yeah. And I'm going to link all of that to this episode's blog post. Also... If you go over there, hey, you might recognize me because I have a water cooler chat over there about ICVT that kind of, as much as you can do a drive-through understanding of ICVT, I, I attempted it and they graciously are sharing that video over there as well. So yeah, I will put the links to the YouTube channel. I'll put the links to ICVT.online, to your book. You can find that at Amazon. I'm sure you can find it at a lot of different online retailers for books and yeah any any more information you want about upcoming trainings or availability or books icbt.online is going to be a great resource so thanks again fred thanks for the time thanks for having me it was a pleasure to meet you thank you for that wow y'all okay first things first what a great conversation i feel like not only were we able to break down and simplify icbt a bit more to help increase understanding but also i feel like we were gifted an opportunity to really get to know fred a bit better and that's pretty cool because i don't know about you fam but sometimes i see folks like fred and while i'm super thankful for all the ways they've contributed to the field it can be hard to relate or sometimes even understand what they're saying they're smart, they know a lot, but sometimes it's just hard to get that connection. But not only could I relate, I now know that I'm not alone when I take pretend phone calls. <laughs> Unless I'm doing that at a wedding I've crashed, and then I'm finding less community there. So Red, thanks for being a great sport and, you know, shooting the shit. Second thing, I just want to, I want to take a moment to note that I am talking about Fred during an intrusive thought segment. And can we just, can we just allow ourselves a moment to enjoy that irony? I mean, I bet if you had a dollar for every time that you could say that, Fred, I bet you would have exactly one dollar. <laughs> but for real, it, it does tickle me because you see, fam, ICBT is not about the intrusions. But I have to say, I... I, at this point, I love it, and I'm here for the irony. So I, I just have to mention before I go, after I wrapped up this interview with Fred, I was hanging out with my brother, and I mentioned that Fred and I talked about Monopoly. 
And where I was shocked that he's never not finished a full game of Monopoly, and he was confounded probably to learn that I have never completed an actual game of Monopoly. My brother, he illuminated that our family actually never played Monopoly by the official rules. In fact, I couldn't even tell you what the official rules are because all of the, uh uh-uh, but what about this rule? No, but this one. I learned all of those rules, if you will, were house rules. That yes, well, our family played it that way. That is not actually the way the game of Monopoly is played. And why? Why did we play that way? Because that's how my dad learned how to play, and he taught us how to play. And why did his family play that way? I'll give you a guess. And this is why I never, ever played a game all the way through. And it would take hours and hours and hours to even get to the point where we're like, you know what, we're calling it stops here. Good game, good game. This is why I've never completed a game of Monopoly. It's because I've never actually played the game. I've played our family's version of the game. And so this was like a real aha moment for me because I even said like, what? Like, you mean dad never actually read the rules to discover like we weren't playing the right way all along? As aghast as I was at that, guess who else never read the rules? Apparently me. (laughs) Because if I had, I would have known we're not actually playing the game Monopoly. We're playing our weird family version using all these same pieces and completely different rules and strategies, etc. And so if it's really true that the rules we played by, the version of the game that I didn't tend to enjoy and never finished, aren't actually the rules to this game, And had we actually played the actual rules as evidenced by the directions in the box, the game reportedly here doesn't take years to complete. And so most folks finish the game they started. And if I then choose to actually go play Monopoly for the first time, apparently, the process here is going to require me to do some relearning on how the game functions in reality. I mean, I'm going to have to take the time to understand, especially if I get completely confused or sucked back into an old understanding of how to play, because it's not real. It's not relevant to this game that we're actually participating in right now. I'm playing the weird, whatever, alternative, upside down version of Monopoly. And my brain is going to be really good at going to that version, because I literally, I can't even think of how to conceptualize it another way. Because that was my experience. And so my brain is going to be really good at going there. But I can still learn how to play it by the actual rules. What's happening right here, right now? So I guess the addendum I could make here is not that I've never finished a game of Monopoly. But actually, I've never started a game of Monopoly either. And this is the bubble we can live in sometimes. And it can be shocking. I mean, it's not a big deal. But on the other hand, it's like, how did I not know this for decades? Shocking. I mean, I was playing something, but it wasn't Monopoly. So this week, fam, I want you to think about this and how this applies to you. Where have you or your loved ones engaged so fully into something that wasn't even reality? What's your version of Monopoly? And what would it be like to practice reorienting yourself to the here and now, to the rules, to the actual common sense, five sense reality in the present? For me, whether I choose to play an actual game of Monopoly or not, I have a vested interest in reading through the rules because my mind only knows the imagined ones. Maybe I'll be like, man, that makes so much more sense. Maybe I'll be like, what? How does that work? I don't get it. Maybe it'll sound fun. Maybe it won't. Maybe I'll be like, I don't miss out on anything per se. But hey, here's the real win. I get to choose. Not OCD. Not past experience. No hearsay about other people that reportedly finish 100% of their games. Me. Me. Now talk about a win. That sounds like my kind of Monopoly fam. Freedom in the present. 
So thanks again to Fred for joining us today. And you know what? Construction, Fred. It looks like you got to build something after all here to forge and create and support this path, the ICBT path in our treatment landscape. So thank you. And thank you, fam, because we really are better together. Thank you for joining me and our OCD family community. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please like and subscribe to the OCD Family Podcast wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Did you find this content helpful? Please consider leaving a review. The more people that know they're not alone, the better. For more information regarding today's podcast, please visit OCDFamilyPodcast.com and remember to join the email list while you're there. It will provide you with the most up-to-date information, resources, and the demo on the family chatter. Oh yeah. Nothing says family like chatting it up with Fred and thinking through all he said. That's right. I went there. And you can too at OCDFamilyPodcast.com.